Gosh, I was really excited to, uh, and thrilled to be, to be involved in this conference. I've heard really great things, and I'm already seeing why. This is my first time here, um, but also super pleased to be here to talk about this. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, um, building the practice at the Home Office. There's going to be um, quite a few nods as well to uh, Kate's talk, because a lot of what we did here was... Um, about building uh, uh, people and teams, but there were also lots of logistics, and, um, and I was learning and being inspired by Kate's work at Government Digital Service, GDS, um, at the time. So you'll see uh, lots of parallels, I think. Um, so I work at the Home Office. Um, I work in a, uh, we actually have a team now of 100 user researchers and designers. Um, uh, and these are some of the services that we work on. Things like um, applying for a passport um, uh, uh, or for visas, public facing services. Um, also, we work on internal tools, things that help staff to manage applications um, or that um, allow staff to share uh, intelligence or resettle refugees. Um, and these are really, really big services. Um, they, they impact millions of people. Um, uh, and, um, and it's the heavy stuff. We have some of the hardest problems in government, I think, at the Home Office. Um, and, um, uh, and like I said, we've got 100, 100 people in the community now, thereabouts. Um, we're growing all the time. Um, some of them are here today. Um, and um, it's a really vibrant and positive community, a really strong community. Um, and that's something I'm really proud of. Um, it took a lot of hard work to get here. Um, uh, and um, uh, these are some a collection, a collage. I, I went, uh, went through my Twitter timeline um, uh, this week, and I, I gathered together a, a load of photos. There's more than this. Um, but these are from our regular community meetups that we have. Um, we've been having them every two weeks since 2014. Um, we use them as an opportunity to come together as a community, which is really, really important when uh, you've got teams kind of distributed in different locations like we have. Um, and it's an opportunity to share best practice, share our work. Um, and then increasingly, we've been inviting speakers in from, from outside to come um, and inspire us and, and give us a moment to, to pause and reflect before we go out into the hard work that, that, that we're doing. Um, there's some, uh, we've had some really kind of illustrious speakers as well, um, as well as kind of industry experts. So we've got like uh, Tia came very recently to talk to us about neurodiversity um, and autism. Um, uh, we've had people come, we've got Sarah Gold there coming before she set up What If projects, um, the service design consultancy. We've got people that came from BBC to um, uh, showcase their uh, workshop before they went to Euro IA. Um, uh, we've even uh, we've got Dana Chisnell, the amazing Dana Chisnell of civic design in the US. Um, Simon Wardley and his maps um, came and gave us a talk. Um, and we've even got Jared Spool there, uh, came and gave his design as a team sport um, talk. So um, uh, it's been pretty, pretty cool to have that. And... Um, uh, as well as that, we're getting, um, we're getting really organized. So we became members of the Market Research Society uh, and really tightened up our approach to ethics and in informed consent. Um, we now train all of our new starters in uh, data protection and, and ethics, um, which are obviously super important. Um, and when things like GDPR come in, it, it, it left us in a really good place to deal with that. Um, We've even got um, an internship, uh, uh, an award-winning, sorry, uh, internship. Um, this one, an award earlier this year from the Real IT Awards. Um, uh, uh, this, um, uh, we set this up ourselves from scratch. Uh, uh, and this summer, we had 450 applicants for, for 20 intern places across all of the professions. Um, there were 150 for our user research posts. Um, and the reason it's so hotly contested, we think, is because we take real care. I think we take real, genuine, individual care over the people that, that join the team um, and, and grow them and develop them. Um, so, um, thinking about it, this is what... Um, this is exactly how it should be. This is how um, user research uh, and design should be operating in, in what is one of the great departments of state, isn't it? Um, and as Danny alluded to earlier, um, just four years ago, uh, we only had two, two junior researchers um, and zero budget. 
So how did we do it? Um, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about that today. Uh, this is um, like my story of what worked for us in, in our circumstances. Um, uh, hopefully, it'll be useful for you, for you too. OK, so um, I've very helpfully, in true conference talk fashion, I've grouped this into four um, easy steps. No, kidding, they're not easy. Um, but <laughs> four kind of groups, four areas. Um, and as I look back over, over the last four years, these years, these were the four um, areas where we had the most success. So first, go under the radar. Um, now, <clears throat> excuse me, for me, uh, this meant very much um, uh, uh, going ahead and doing the right thing, not waiting for permission um, uh, before going ahead and doing it. Um, and uh, uh, this was very much inspired by this indomitable lady. Um, uh, uh, and it's not often I say the word lady, but in this instance, I feel it's appropriate. Um, Grace Hopper, for those of you who don't know, was a rear admiral in the US and, and also kind of a legend computer programmer. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't into, oh, she's also all over the internet. Um, so have a look. And she's, she has loads of really fascinating and brilliant quotes attributed to her, and this is one of them. Um, I wasn't introduced to her uh, by finding her on the internet. I was introduced to her by people who are working at, at government digital service, including Lisa Reichelt um, and others. Um, and this was incredibly um, liberating uh, for me at the time. Um, I suddenly felt I really took this to heart, and I suddenly felt really empowered to just actually get out there and, and do the right thing, um, to go ahead and do the things that I felt needed to be done in order to transform government. That's what we were there to do. And so um, uh, the story I'm going to tell you about, specifically relating to this, um, is for uh, uh, <clears throat> when, I first, um, when I first was in this role. We, um, I was lucky enough to uh, be working with somebody who was a, a specialist in access needs research. And uh, she, uh, working with her, made me realize that we weren't approaching accessibility particularly well at that point. Um, she wanted to run some training uh, for the teams. It was a really good idea. Um, but remember, I had zero budget um, uh, and no resources. And everybody who was working uh, in the team had to be allocated 100% of their time, or rather almost full time, to, to a project. Um, she was also on a short term contract, so she was quite expensive. So um, I found a way uh, around it. Um, this uh, is uh, an original photo from one of our very, very early um, uh, resourcing walls. We called it a resourcing wall. Um, we were a really small organization, uh, Home Office Digital, within Home Office. And every week, we would gather in front of this wall um, and, um, uh, and try and ensure that everybody that we had, most of whom were at that point on, on short-term short -term expensive contracts, make sure that they were being allocated to a project so we weren't incurring a budget, uh, a budget deficit. Um, and it was um, quite a long conversation. Um, over time, this wall grew in size. There was more and more projects and more and more people. Um, each sticker, so each purple sticker there is a, a project, and each sticker below it is a, a, an individual's name. And our job was to go through and make sure that we had the right people on the right project. Um, I always, what I did, <laughs> it's a bit sneaky, um, what I did was get um, this individual's name on, on the sticker and just kind of hide it down the bottom right. Okay, and then this became quite a long conversation. By the time they got about 75% of the way through the conversation, people were getting a bit bored and a bit fatigued. Um, uh, and then, so when they finally came to this kind of like miscellaneous group down the bottom, um, I would get asked what's happening with this individual. And I'd say, oh, oh I, she's just finishing up on something. I need to brief her later today. I'll do that and then I'll move her on, on the resource wall. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get to it. And this worked for quite a while. Um, over <laughs> yeah, several weeks, months even, every now and then she'd do a short research project. Um, but most of the time, I was able to protect her time. And, um, and that meant that we then freed her up to start running um, some training. Um, uh, that's her on the left, a uh, very, very early session, March 2015. Um, so she started running training in access needs awareness and more specifically in how to carry out research with people with access needs um, if you're a user researcher. And, uh, and then to generate more value out of this, I um, asked her to then train up two new civil servants that had just started. That's Emily and James that you see in the other 
uh, photo. Um, and I said, right, I can't keep hiding you on the wall forever. We'll have a fixed period of time, train them up, they'll become the access needs team. And that's what we did. Um, we trained them up um, and they started running training themselves and then they started um, using their initiative and doing really, really great things like running um, awareness raising days, uh, events, sorry, at kind of team away days. And we got a load of kind of um, impairment simulators that you'll see here that were really good for just generating interest in conversation um, and also look great in, in Twitter photos. <laughs> Um, super fun. Um, so, uh, to date, they've trained 120 staff, um, and that's across um, the Home Office, but also outside of government, so we regularly open up, uh, up slots in our training for, for teams outside. Um, and, um, uh, and when the new permanent secretary at the Home Office arrived last year, um, he arrived as the civil service champion for disability. And our senior management were very, very happy and pleased to be able to put us up in front of him so we could tell him about the work that we'd been doing. That was what enabled me to then start uh, leveraging some access to funding. And we now have a dedicated access needs and accessibility team. And we're, we're looking to expand that out again um, next year. They're now ca uh, carrying out code reviews, accessibility uh, audits, um, as well as consultancy and, and all the training. Number two, um, get organized. This is um, very much uh, uh, Kate made so many references to this. We were expanding, we were getting bigger, we were under a lot of demand. The government digital service, GDS, were uh, stipulating that user research had to be involved in the research and design of, of government services. So demand was high, um, we needed to get organized. Um, so we started uh, looking at the, the kind of the key Pain point, super simple. We all know recruiting participants for research is hard, okay? It's one of the hardest things to do. It's time consuming, everyone complains about it. We were having trouble with, you know, even when you outsource it, you don't necessarily get great participants. And we were trying to do a lot of work with people with access needs or with low digital skills, um, people who aren't necessarily um, in your usual kind of recruiter's um, uh, uh, sites. So um, I also knew at this point that we had thousands and thousands of people uh, calling the Home Office every day, um, calling them, uh, emailing us, trying to get in touch. Um, and I thought, well, hang on, why don't we set up our own internal recruitment service? So we did. I had um, uh, one person who uh, had just joined me on secondment. Um, we had agreed to retrain her. The photo up there is her um, uh, very first workshop. After this workshop, she came and spoke to me um, and, and told me how passionately she wanted to move into user research. I said, okay, you come and be, come and be seconded. Um, and 50% of your time will train you, and then 50% of your time, can you set up this participant recruitment agency, um, internal kind of agency? And she was said, yep, yeah, that sounds great. Um, she was really pleased, actually, to be able to kind of arrive and then start contributing to the team immediately, not just feeling like a spare part and that she was like a drain on other people. So she started, um, she did a fantastic job. She had really great domain knowledge. She was recruiting internal as well as external users. She started with the um, access needs team, a number of initiatives going out to charities and organizations that work with people with various access needs and using those as ways to, to source participants for research. All the time I was reporting back um, on the savings that, that she was generating by recruiting internally rather than using an outside agency. So next, um, next up, labs. We, uh, we, we saw the work that Kate was doing over at GDS, and we were like, that's a good idea, let's build a lab. Um, let's build a low-cost lab, though, um, initially. Let's see how, how, uh, how, how, um, how much value we can get from a lab. And we built a lab for, um, I think it was just under 10,000 pounds. We've got one now in Sheffield as well as one in, uh, in London. Um, and this is all available on GitHub. I'll, I'll share this link afterwards. Um, uh, where we've detailed how we've done it, why we've chosen the spec we've chosen, um, how to plug it all together in really nice hand-drawn diagrams. Um, 
Uh, and this really kicked off as well. Um, uh, again, every time people use the lab, I report back uh, the number, uh, the amount of potential money, therefore, that's been saved. Um, and over, I think, just over this last year, we've saved £100,000 just on participant recruitment on, on labs. Um, and that helped me to generate support and funding for uh, a dedicated research ops team. So we now have, um, we have three, well, we have two people who are waiting for one person to join the team who's going through recruitment right now. Um, that are kind of hands-on running the labs, and then we've got a research ops lead that's um, doing a lot more work around um, the repository, which is what's next. So um, this section is all about adding value um, when you're, uh, to whatever you're doing, whenever you can. Um, uh, it's kind of doubling down on the really good work that you're doing already. Um, and um, what we wanted to do um, uh, as, we, uh, as we were developing, we were hitting all the problems that Kate was mentioning earlier, that, that, that Danny was too, um, about um, uh, fast-paced delivery teams uh, and losing insight. So um, I wrote a blog post. Um, we started um, uh, getting, asking teams to think about um, what artifacts they, 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 they store, what, which they create, what, what they store, where they store them. Um, uh, and we did some work around that to try and help us uh, find, uh, find, the res find the insight, make sure that, um, the pe that we know what we know and that we can then make sure that the people who need to know what we know, know what we know. <laughs> if... <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so, so, yes, so we did that, um, and uh, uh, our teams work in um, uh, these kind of very kind of fast-paced, co-located, uh, agile delivery teams, and our researchers are embedded within those teams. So, um, uh, and what that means is that our, predominantly our user researchers' audience is the team, the immediate team around them, um, and this is great. We, we work in this way deliberately. It means that... Um, it means the information is passed quickly. Um, uh, the, the teams build up a context and an understanding of their users. That's what we want to achieve. Um, however, when we started to look at the artifacts that we were asking them to store, what we found is that they were very often full of acronyms um, and references to shared knowledge, um, things that made it uh, hard for, for anybody outside the team to see. So the very way that we were asking teams to work was um, making it difficult for us to share that, uh, that understanding at a, at a broader level. So we had to have a rethink about um, uh, what our objectives were and, and, and change how we were thinking about the problem. Um, we realized that if we were going to have impact what, what we wanted to achieve was to have impact in the Home Office. And to do that, um, we wanted to influence um, a different audience. So we have the team audience, but we were also trying to influence a separate audience. And that audience was a, seat, was, uh, a number of um, stakeholders, people like um, operations directors who, who care about um, managing demand um, uh, within their environment, which is also quite key to user experience, um, about impacting policymakers who care about meeting policy intent, but actually are also really quite interested in um, engaging with the electorate and ensuring that there is a healthy democracy. Um, so when we thought about those people, um, uh, and we thought about how they might go about finding insight, um, we realised that more often than not, they are likely to ask a person. Um, that's just how it is in, in quite often in, in, in large uh, organizations that have grown organically over time. It's, that's how it is with us. And so um, organized files and folders um, will only get you so far. What we realized is that as well as, as being organized in how we do this, we also need people. Um, and so we kind of settled upon this idea that as well as uh, our kind of uh, our folders, we've, we're looking for, um, and we've become, curators. Um, I really like this uh, definition, although it uh, 
Danny felt rightly it was more kind of swayed to skewed towards museums. But um, the, you know, the idea that, uh, of being a custodian or a keeper, um, a, a conservator, a, a guardian, a caretaker, that, that feels um, much more appropriate when, when we consider what we are now trying to do in our, with our research repository um, uh, in the Home Office. Our, our research repository isn't a tool. Um, that's partly because we just don't have the scope or the budget for that right now. But it's also because we took a look at the way our organisation works and we thought about what our objectives were and we thought, how can we kind of make that work in this, with those constraints? And so our repository that we get asked a lot, uh, about a lot um, is, is, is some files, well-organised files and, and some people. Okay, last one. Um, do great work. Uh, uh, this is kind of, might sound obvious, but um, for us, this meant doing, uh, doing the best possible work that we could um, in the situation in which we find ourselves. And the reason I think you should do it too is because um, it's absolutely the best way to, uh, it's the best advert for yourselves, it's the best advert for the value of user research. Um, it's, it's a great way to promote um, your, your team um, and, and, and the profession. It's also uh, one of the best recruitment tools I've ever had. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit um, about some of the best work that we've done at the Home Office, which was um, by these two. Um, now, do you remember I mentioned two junior user researchers? This is them. Um, I had zero budget, um, uh, uh, but I had been uh, loaned these two who were, had come to me on a, a graduate trainee program. And, um, and so, um, uh, so what I, this is, I was gonna, <laughs> this is my Waterloo moment, if you like. Um, and what I decided to do with this was, this was my only precious resource. Um, this is uh, all I had. So I thought, what, what can I do with them? They're the only people that aren't gonna be resourced to projects. Let's get them to focus on something that the people on projects haven't got the time or the space to do. Let's get them to look at how, uh, at digital inclusion. So I said, right. You don't have a lot of experience, but you're super motivated, you're super sharp, you're super keen to lead. Go out and make sure that the home office includes people with low digital skills, low confidence, or uh, who don't have access to the internet. Make sure that they're included in the design and build um, of, of home office services. And they just went out and did some really exceptional work. Um, they, started, um, they started with visas, um, uh, uh, and they started, uh, they wanted to understand how, uh, how people who are applying for visas get help with technology. Um, they ran some, a three-month ethnographic study in, uh, with immigration advisors in Bradford. This is a, a, one of those. Um, they ran uh, 20 depth interviews with, with people applying for visas and their technology supporters. Um, they even ran some um, live, a series of live usability tests. Um, and these were these involved visiting people in their home and watching them fill out the form for real. Um, it took up to five hours for people to fill up these forms. Um, they then um, uh, went and tracked those submitted applications through the caseworking system, through uh, the people making decisions about, about those cases, and tried to map usability flaws on the front end with um, uh, the levels of confidence that staff were feeling about the decisions that they were making um, to try and track that. Now, this is kind of work that we just weren't doing. We weren't getting the chance to do this kind of work anywhere else um, in, our, in our teams. They were, they were attempting things that, um, that other people just weren't, weren't attempting. Um, they were you know, implementing in the wild interventions and then trying to measure that in real time. They were designing and researching offline um, experiences. And because they were so ambitious and because the, the quality of their work was so high, they started, they, sorry, they made a huge, huge step forward in selling the value of user research within the organization. UK Visas and Immigration now have their own digital inclusion team. Um, they, uh, uh, the research fed into an, a tender and a, a procurement for a supplier of a, a support 
provision service um, to UKVI. This has um, uh, been rolled out now, I think, to 400 libraries, maybe more, um, where people who are struggling with technology can get help with using the online form. They can, there's, they can have that by phone, they can have that face-to-face -face in the library, or they'll even get a visit at home if they really need that. <clears throat> So it's really, really changed how this organization is operating. But it's also been super helpful for me because they built this real reputation for quality work. This is Clive, who was leading the GDS um, equivalent team at that point. Um, this is one of many kind of uh, uh, lots and lots of feedback I got. We were building this reputation within government. Um, and of course, that meant when I was lobbying um, senior stakeholders in my team, they were starting to feel really quite proud rightly so, of the work that we were doing. And so I used that as leverage, uh, and we now have a, a dedicated assisted digital team um, uh, carrying out research, um, uh, helping to uh, parts of the organization to think about people who struggle with technology at a time when government is increasingly moving online. Um, and I think that's it. So um, uh, my four kind of key areas, um, things that have really worked for us, um, but as Danny says, there's probably another kind of subtext around this, which is about um, having a team of many leaders and encouraging them to lead, of giving them um, appropriate direction, uh, support, um, uh, and, um, and being really lucky that they're like super motivated. And also having great support from um, an organization like GDS who were creating a whole kind of set of resources that we could lean on, um, uh, as well as also being a beacon of good work uh, that attracted good people to come and be part of our mission. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you. <laughs>